To all our viewers from all corners of the world, a very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you, depending on where you are all around the globe. Welcome to the 10th virtual panel discussion hosted by American Sri Lankan Photographic Art Society in Los Angeles, California, USA, a member of Photographic Society of America. PSA and the International Federation of Photography of Art in France, FIAP. The objective of our panel discussion series is to promote and showcase the incredibly rich biodiversity of the Pearl of the Indian Ocean, Sri Lanka, to the world. I'm your host, Medhini Ratnayaka, streaming live from Los Angeles, California, USA, and connecting with our panelists in Sri Lanka. This week's topic is behavior of Asian elephant in Sri Lanka. Today, we have a proficient personality on the subject matter with us to share valuable information about this majestic creature. Let's meet our panelist, Dr. Prithviraj Fernando. Dr. Prithviraj Fernando qualified as a medical doctor but decided to pursue a career in conservation biology. He obtained a MSc and a PhD in biological sciences from the University of Oregon, USA. The title of his PhD thesis was Genetics, Ecology and Conservation of the Asian Elephant. He pioneered genetic analysis of Asian elephants using their dung and initiated radio tracking of elephants in Sri Lanka. In 1999, he joined Columbia University in New York, where he continued research on Asian elephants. During this time, Dr. Fernando conducted a range-wide genetic evaluation of Asian elephants and established the elephants in Borneo were not feral, but a distinct subspecies. He also explored the critically endangered Javan rhino and the African rhino. In year 2004, he returned to Sri Lanka and instituted the Center for Conservation and Research where Dr. Fernando is the chairperson. The focus of CCR has been on conducting research, conservation of findings to policy, better management of mitigating the human elephant conflict in the island and conserve elephants. Dr. Fernando has conducted studies on elephants and advised on elephant management and human elephant conflict mitigation for governments and conservation agencies in Sri Lanka, India, Bangladesh, Nepal, Indonesia, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, Myanmar, and Malaysia. In addition to publishing numerous scientific journals, 
Dr. Fernando has conducted a review of human elephant conflict mitigation that's in South Asia with WWF. He is a member of Asian Elephant Specialist Group, a working group on producing guidelines for human elephant conflict mitigation. Dr. Fernando is currently authoring a guide on human elephant conflict mitigation for the World Bank to be circulated in Asia and Africa. Dr. Fernando has been a research associate of the Smithsonian Institution USA since year 2005. He has supervised graduate students from Sri Lanka, India, USA, and Japan. Dr. Fernando currently serves on doctoral students advisory committees in the University of Colombo and National Institute of Advanced Studies in India. He has received the Presidential Award for Scientific Excellence in Sri Lanka and the Whitley Award from Her Royal Highness, Princess Anne. So, Dr. Fernando, we warmly welcome you to our panel discussion and we would like to open this forum to you to discuss more about our favorite subject today, about the behavior of the Asian elephant. So take it away. Thank you, Medini. And uh, I'd like to thank ASPS and also uh, Mr. Surya Pereira for having uh, inviting me to do this presentation. So let's uh, get started. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about elephants in Sri Lanka, particularly about their behavior. And So to give you some background on Asian elephants, Asian elephants used to range from present day Iran and Iraq through all of Southeast, South Asia to Southeast Asia to present day China, maybe a few centuries ago. But today they are limited to 13 range countries in South and Southeast Asia, where they exist in a number of isolated and fragmented populations. Now, among these 13 range countries, Sri Lanka holds a very, very special place. Because for one thing, it's one of the only three island populations of Asian elephants, the other two being Sumatra and Borneo. And Sri Lanka has only less than 2% of the global Asian elephant habitat, but we have about 10 to 20% of the global Asian elephant population in the world. So if you take the size of the country and the number of elephants in the country, that gives you basically a country density of elephants. If you look at this ratio between the size of the country and the number of elephants in the country for the 13 range countries, Sri Lanka has about 10 times the density of any of the other countries. So as a result, there are a lot of elephants in Sri Lanka, and where are they? These are survey that we have done recently and completed. So this one of these little squares is 25 square kilometers. Now, this was a questionnaire survey where we went to each of these squares and asked the people whether there were elephants in that area. What we found was that there were elephants in 62% of Sri Lanka. The red areas are areas where there are no longer elephants. The green areas, there are no resident people. So that means these are the protected areas of the Wildlife Conservation Department and the Forest Department. And the yellow areas are where people and elephants live together. So the areas without resident people in Sri Lanka is about 18% of the country. The area without elephants is about 38% of the country. But six, so 44% of the country, there are elephants and people living in the same landscape. Now this is something very unique among the 13 Asian elephant range countries. No other country has such a 
large area. In, in fact, in Sri Lanka, 70% of elephant range falls outside their protected areas. So this is something very unique. And this is one of the reasons that we have such a high density of elephants in Sri Lanka. So as a result, there are many, many places in Sri Lanka where you can see wild elephants, which is again, very uncommon. It's only in Sri Lanka and India that you can see elephants like this. And there's no doubt that Sri Lanka is the best place in the world to see Asian elephants. So there are parks like Minere Kaurulla, which has been famous as the uh, site of the gathering, which has been, uh, which was thought of by and promoted by Mr. Gyan De Silva Giratna, my friend. And so it's become a world famous event where you have hundreds of elephants gathering in these areas in the dry season to feed on the lush grass on the reservoir bed. You can see them playing around in the water, bathing, drinking. And then in the parks such as Maduruvaya, Uduwalaway in the south, you can see Asian elephants in savanna grassland type of habitats. You can observe them. And in the south, in Yala, Lunukamera, you can see them in much more drier, thorn forest kind of habitats. And many of these elephants are very used to people. So you can actually uh, get very close to them and observe them very well. In addition, like you said, there are a lot of elephants, 70% of the elephant range in Sri Lanka is outside protected areas. So there are many areas in Sri Lanka where you can see elephants even outside protected areas. So here is a herd of elephants crossing a road that actually goes through the Yala National uh, Park. So you will come across elephants in different parts of Sri Lanka, um, even on main roads. This is in Hambantata where there's development, ongoing development in areas with elephants. This is uh, couple of adult males that are coming into a harvested paddy field to eat the leftover harvest. So these are sites that could be observed in many parts of Sri Lanka. You can see elephants in um, many of the reservoirs, the small reservoirs, which we call tanks in different parts of the country. This is again in the south, we are a family group of elephants are uh, coming into a water hole, drinking, bathing, and the baby is playing around in the water. Now, everybody in the world loves to see elephants. So elephants are a great resource for our country in terms of tourism, whether it's national or international tourism. But in addition, um, also, Sometimes in some of the parks, say Yala and Min area, this has led to some controversy of and issues of maybe even overcrowding. But Sri Lanka clearly is the best place in the world to see Asian elephants. Now, in addition to that, elephants hold a very important place in the hearts of Sri Lankan people. And particularly throughout our history, our culture and our religions, elephants are a very important species. Now, if you look at Asian elephants, the males of Asian elephants have tusks, unlike African elephants, where both the males and females have tusks. In Asian elephants, it's only the males that have tusks. But in Sri Lanka, it's only about 5% of the males that have tusks. Now, if you compare that to the closest Asian elephant population in India, South India, there are 95% of the males have tusks, so completely the opposite. And why is that? That's because we love tuskers. In Sri Lanka, tuskers are almost venerated from the wild and bringing them into captivity. And we have reduced the incidence of tuskers in the wild. Now, if you look at different parts of Sri Lanka, there are also some differences. Elephants in the northwest of the country tend to be taller, few more tuskers. In the north, 
east of the country, especially the Mahavali flood plains, the elephants are stockier, more heavily built. At one time, they were in fact classified as a different subspecies called the swamp elephant, no longer recognized. And then the elephants in the south are, tend to be a little bit smaller, shorter in stature, which were called Ruhunugeta in the past. So there are some regional differences. Now, a lot of the studies work that we do is based on individual identification of elephants. Elephants are like people. Each of us are different. And similarly, each elephant is different from another elephant. So to identify individual elephants, we use the number of characters, particularly the folds on the ears. The, we use the folds on the top of the ear, which we call the primary fold, and the fo ear folds on itself, which we call the secondary fold. And these are different from elephant to elephant. So in this elephant, the folds are very strong. And this fold is the primary fold. Yes. But in this year, the secondary fold is folded in inside. And on this year, it's folded outside. So these are characters that are constant throughout their lives and allow us to identify individual elephants. And then elephant ears have tails. They have holes, sometimes due to being shot at. The tail of the elephant, if you take the tail of a cow, it has hair all around the end of the tail. But in an elephant, it's on the front and the back. And the pattern of the hair differs from elephant to elephant. Some have the hair in front longer, some have a lot of hair, some have little hair. Sometimes the tails get broken off. And then, so we can use those characters also to identify individual animals. Now, of course, if they have tusks, that makes it a lot easier because tusks are different in shape, size, angle, everything. So it's very easy to identify elephants with tushers or tusks as individuals. So we use these characters and make identity cards for elephants. And this can be applied to male elephants, female elephants, and even young elephants. So babies, young elephants tend to have less characters, but still you can identify different characters. Now, talking about individual elephants, Sri Lanka also has the highest genetic diversity of Asian elephants in the world. And perhaps as a result of that, we have a number of very unique individuals. If you look at this picture, you can see that one of the elephants is a little bit different. This baby, the color is different. This is a white elephant that was initially uh, recognized about 25 years ago. And now she's a fully grown female. And in fact, uh, now she has a baby. She lives in the Gala National Park. Here you can see her with the herd and the baby. And very recently, Sri Lanka was in the news because of the identification of a pair of twins. They were identified by Dr. Sumit Pilapitiya in the Minneria National Park. So this is the first time in the world that wild twins were identified among Asian elephants. So again, another first for Sri Lanka. This guy is a dwarf elephant, the only known dwarf elephant in the whole world. And he comes into the Udo Alave National Park when he's seen must in June, July every year. And here you see an interaction of him with another normal sized male. And now you can clearly see the difference between him and the taller young adult male. We also have very few Tuskers, but we still do have some very impressive characters. So this is Saddanta, who again comes into the Minne area Kaudulla parks when he's in Mast uh, around June, July, and August. Now, if you look at elephants, the males and the females look a little bit different. The males have a bigger head. They have, uh, the back is sloping, whereas in a female, the back is, we say, box-shaped. And then, of course, the genitalia, and then the females also, you can see the breast. So that allows us to identify females and males easily. And males can be about three times the size of females. And males generally 
repair, start reproducing at probably at about 25 years of age. They can be reproductively active from about 10 years of age. But because of competition between males, they probably don't get to mate till about 25 years of age. And we believe that they probably live, have about 40 years lifespan in the wild. Males come into a state called must every year for about two months of the year. And in, during this time, we have secretion from the temporal gland, which is located between the ear and the eye. And there's urine rippling. And these produce a very, very strong scent, which even we can perceive from a few hundred meters away. And elephants, because they have such a fabulous sense of smell, probably can identify the smell from many kilometers away. Now, if you look at females, a female can be mated at about eight years of age. So gestation is 22 months, almost two years, the longest gestation of any mammal. And then she can produce a baby at about 10 years of age. And thereafter, every about four, four and a half years or five years, she can have another baby. And we think that females might live a little bit longer than males, especially because they don't come into conflict with people. And so they may live for about 40 or 50 years. And during a lifetime, a female may produce six to 10 offspring. Now, if you look at the social organization of elephants, we know that we have, there are herds of elephants. Now the smallest social unit among elephants is the mother calf unit. So that is a female with 30 dependent offspring, which is not a social unit. That is the single unit because the, the baby is dependent on the mother, but that's only for about two years. And beyond that, if he remains, if he or she remains with the mother, then it becomes a social association. So the mother can have another baby after about another four or five years. Now we can have a female with two juveniles. And so every four or five years, the mother can have another baby and the herd or group can continue to grow. And when the first baby, when, if it's a female, when she's about eight years, she can start having her own babies. So a group of females, a female herd can have elephants representing three or even four generations. So this living in this female society, in these groups of females, allows the young elephants to have a lot of interaction with each other. So they spend a lot of time playing with each other. The male elephants test their strength from a very young age and they, you can often see them butting their heads and jousting with each other. So that helps them establish a hierarchy among the males. Now, also there is a phenomenon called allomothering where some of the, sometimes, not commonly, but somewhat rarely, a single baby may be fed by more than one female. So these are instances in Yala where this baby whom we call Damianti is fed by her mother who's dummy and, but also another female in the group, Devi. So that's called allomothering. So that helps bring up babies, perhaps in very tough conditions. And also the younger females also take care of the younger, the juvenile babies. So for example, if you take the twins in mean area, there is a younger female who's probably about four or five years of age, who spends a lot of time with the babies and closely associates with them. Now she may be a older offspring of the same female, or she could be a cousin of theirs and not a sibling. Now the male babies, they, once they are born, they again, for the first two years, they are very close to the mother, but then very soon they become, start getting more independent of the mother and the herd and slowly they tend to drift away. By the time they are about 10 years of age, they leave the herd. There used to be uh, thought that, they, that males were chased out of the herd, but we have never seen this happening. What we have seen is that they tend to voluntarily drift away from the herd. And after about 10 or so years, they become mostly independent. And as adults, they lead a mostly solitary life. 
But of course, clearly males and females have to get together to mate and procreate. So males, when they come into a female herd, will go and check out the ladies. And you will often see that when a male approaches a female, the female will urinate, pass urine, and the male will sense the urine with his trunk and place the trunk in his mouth. And there are special glands in the palate of the elephants that tells them the reproductive status of the female. Because females come into mating condition called estrus for only a few days every four to five years. So that it, it is advantageous for a male to find out whether this female is about to come into estrus or not. In addition, so females pass hormones in their urine and perhaps in the dark. And in African elephants, it's also thought that they produce a mating call. We don't know whether that happens in Asian elephants. But anyhow, when there is a female in estrus, all the males in the surrounding area get to know it somehow. And all of them come there and they want to mate with this female. And then clearly there is competition among them. So whenever there is a estrus female in a group, you will find a number of big adult males associating with that group. So it's when there is competition to mate with the estrus female, it is the strongest, biggest male that gets to mate. And so although there is competition, it is very rare for elephants to really fight because they have an established dominance hierarchy from their young days. The males that meet will joust with each other and settle and come up with who's stronger and who's not. So they don't really have to fight. But then again, on very rare occasions, you might see serious fights between two equally matched individuals. But again, elephants are not territorial, and this is a very rare occurrence. Males also have their own social organization, and sometimes you get fairly large male groups, numbering maybe 10, 15 adult males. Such male groups are particularly common among resource uh, heavy areas like garbage dumps and uh, some of the outside areas from the parks. Okay, now let's take a look at a little bit about the ranging behavior of elephants. Now an elephant doesn't live in a vacuum. Elephant needs to eat, so it needs to find out where the food is Maybe it also feeds from trees, browsers, and grazers. So it needs to know where the trees, good food trees are. It needs water, so it needs to know where the water is. It associates with other elephants, so it needs to know where they are. So an elephant will walk around in a particular area to find out, to get the resources that it needs to survive. And this area we call a home range. So every animal basically has a home range. We have a home range. So there's a place we work, there's a place we live, there's a place we hang around. So if it's a human, you can ask the person from where are you, where do you work and so on and get an idea of the home range of the person. So every animal basically has a map of its home range in its mind. But with an elephant, there's no way for us to find that out by asking the elephant. So the only way to do that is by collaring elephants, by using radio collars. So together with the wildlife department of Sri Lanka, we have been collaring elephants for the past 25 years. So now when you want to collar an elephant, you have to find an elephant, you have to track the elephant in the field. If you have a footprint of the elephant that passed that way, you can measure it because the circumference of the four foot of the elephant is twice the height uh, twice the circumference is the height of the elephant, then you get an idea how big an elephant you are following. So once you locate the elephant and you decide that this is the particular elephant that you want to collar, the veterinarians take over of the department and they will mix the drugs and then dart the elephant using a darting gun. So earlier we used to dart the elephants and anesthetize them and then quickly put the collar and then revive them again. But now uh, they don't usually anesthetize the elephant, instead they put him into deep sleep. They uh, put them in deep sedation. And the elephant is standing and in very deep sleep. 
So you have to quickly go up to the elephant and put the collar on. So this is uh, somewhat safer for the elephant, but sometimes it's maybe not that safe for the people who are doing the collaring. Now this type of collaring, once you put a collar, originally we used what are called VHF collars, which produced, uh, transmitted a VHF signal uh, continuously. And that is tracked with a directional antenna, like a TV antenna, and to find out where the elephant is. And that we did very interesting information. We found that elephants in Sri Lanka do not have geographically separate seasonal dry season and wet season ranges. Instead, they spend the whole year in the same areas. So they, they don't have seasonal ranges in which they migrate. We found that the average size of a home range of an elephant in Sri Lanka is about 250 square kilometers. So that's about this size. Now, if you look at the distribution of elephants and the size of an average home range, you can clearly see that elephants don't move long distances. But unfortunately in Sri Lanka, the entire elephant conservation and management plan was based on the idea put forward in the 1940s that elephants migrated long distances. So we found that this is not really true. And we have been working on a wrong premise. In the past 15 years or so, we have moved on from VHF collars to GPS satellite collars. So these are much more advanced. Once you put one of these collars, it has a GPS unit, which comes on, we have programmed it to come on every four hours, and it will locate the elephant and record, take a recording of that location and send us the data by satellite every once a day or once in two days. So this has been very useful to learn about elephants and we get a lot of data and we have colored elephants in different parts of the country. The program is being continued by the wildlife department on their own now. And so for example, these are three different elephants in different groups that were colored and tracked in Yala National Parks and the surroundings. So this is the boundary of the Yala National Park. Now this elephant shown in the blue dots, he's ranging both inside and outside the park, whereas this elephant is almost entirely outside the park. So this side is the Yala Park, this is the boundary. An electric fence was put up on the park boundary and you can see the effect of that on this elephant. Earlier, this elephant used to range in and outside but now she cannot go out. So she spends a lot of time all along the fence trying to go out, but unable to go out. So these are things that you can find out by coloring. So this is a view of monthly locations of another herd in the Northwest of about 50 elephants of which we call it one female. And this is her data over a time period of a few months. So this here is the Inginimitia reservoir, and she goes down here to Kotavera and then goes up towards Rajangane. So her home range is about, again, 200, 250 square kilometers, and that is the area she always ranges in. So this is Galgamoa is somewhere here, and then Anuradhapura to the north and Kurunayakala to the south. So this, again, these elephants live entirely, all their lives, entirely outside any protected area. So they do come into a lot of conflict. Now this is looking at an elephant by the time of day. So this is a number of locations for him at noon. The map here is a view of the, uh, the hatched area is open forest and scrubs savanna type of uh, habitat. The solid green areas are covered forests, secondary forests lighter green, and closed canopy forest, that is thick forest in the darker green. So this is where he is at around noon, 4 p.m. By about 8 p.m. he is now moving out of the forest patch where he is residing during the day and going into the open areas. By midnight he's mostly outside and again by early morning he comes back and by 8 a.m. again, he's back where he started. So this kind of information is very important for management and conservation of elephant and also for human elephant conflict mitigation. 
Now this is a view of a number of elephants that were collared in the Min area, Kaurul area. Now we used to believe that elephants that came to Min area and Kaurul came from far away, from as far away as Ritigala, Somavatiya, Vaskamoa. But when we collared them, what we found out was that they were in the same area throughout the year. They just went over the Trinko road to Hurulu. Some of them went towards Dambulla, some of them went towards Sigiriya, but we would have never known this unless we collared these elephants. So such data is also very useful for guiding development and management. Now, if you take a look at the feeding behavior of elephants, elephants have two incisors and 24 molar teeth. So the tusks of elephants that you see are actually incisors and not canines, although they are pointed. Now the molar teeth of the elephants, there are 24, but the 24 are not present at the same time. The, they have a very different system of tooth eruption. The tooth start at the back of the jaws and throughout their lives, like on a conveyor belt, slowly move forward and they break off at the front as they are worn and then the next set replaces them. And so that happens according to uh, how old the elephant is and that can be used to age the elephant because the each tooth that the set are, or there are six sets and each set of teeth have different number of what are called laminae and by looking at that, for, so for example, these are very, very small skull. So this baby had the first tooth fall out and this is the second set. This is a bigger juvenile. So this one has the second and third set is just now coming into play. And this one is an adult elephant, which has the fourth and fifth set. And this is the oldest elephant skull that we have seen in the wild, where there are no longer any more teeth to come out. This is the last set, the sixth set of teeth. And if the elephant lived long enough, this set would also fall off and then it would not have teeth. But we have never found an elephant that has lost all its teeth in the wild. So elephants feed on many things. They are not, they don't chew the cud like cows. They are more like horses, which are also called hindgut fermenters. So they have a shorter digestive tract. And so they eat a lot of food that passes through the digestive tract quickly. So one of the favorite foods of elephants is grass. And if the grass is short, they will kick it out with their feet and then collect it with their trunk and they eat it. So um, they love to eat grass, but if the grass is long, then they will uh, feed on it. Like say in this case, this animal, sorry, is feeding on reeds. So they will break it off with the trunk and just put it in their mouth and eat it. The next choice of elephants is thorny trees, shrubs and trees. So elephants love to eat very thorny shrubs and trees because they don't have poisonous substances in them. And things like andara or kukurumana are some of their favorite foods. Now grass and this kind of thorny vegetation is usually not found in thick forest. So basically, Elephants, although they are wild animals and they live in forests, thick forests, undisturbed forests are not very good elephant habitats. In very thick, undisturbed, close canopy forests, the elephant densities are very low. They are about 0.2 per square kilometer, or you need about 1,200 acres per elephant. On the other hand, if you take savanna grasslands and scrub forest habitats, they support much, much higher densities of elephants and they can support about three elephants per square kilometer. So what happens, a similar thing happens with the um, emptying and filling of tanks or reservoirs where the, as the water goes down, they're converted into grasslands and this annual disturbance creates very good habitat for elephants. So elephants are love disturbed habitats and they do very well. And one of the main factors of disturbance is chena cultivation. So chena or slash and burn cultivation actually creates and maintains the habitat 
that is very good for elephants. So such habitats are mostly or entirely found outside protected areas and they support a very high number of elephants. So if you look at Sri Lanka, we said 70% of elephant habitat is outside these protected areas. So if we want to conserve elephants, a uh, major challenge is to conserve these elephants outside these protected areas because they also come into conflict with people because they are living with people. But conserving elephants and management is another long story, which we will leave for the next day. So thank you very much. And I will stop there. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Fernando. That was a very, very interesting presentation and I'm sure our viewers enjoyed it. And a um, couple of questions for you. Uh, you did mention that there was a very significant event that happened recently in Mineria where with the birth of those twins, uh, those two calves. Uh, so that's something very unique and very significant. So as Sri Lankans, we all have an obligation to make sure that they have a good future and they continue their journey uh, in a safe environment. So in your mind, what are the future prospects? for these, to, uh, these twins to grow up in a uh, safe environment and what can we do to make sure that we develop a safe environment for them? Well, yeah, that's an um, interesting question. So twins, as you know, generally um, elephants, we said carry a pregnancy for almost two years. So carrying two baby elephants for two years by the mother is it's a, quite an achievement. And she has managed to give birth to these uh, two healthy twins. So that she has got over the first obstacle. But now she has to feed these two babies that are demanding milk all the time. And so to feed two elephant babies is not going to be easy for her. But she seems to be in good condition. She belongs to the Min area, uh, Kaunul area elephant uh, population. And that's probably one of our best elephant populations. They have a lot of accessible resources. So I think they have a very good chance, or at least they have the best chance of surviving of uh, you know, any population in Sri Lanka. Um, the, in order for them to survive, however, it is very important that the current conditions in Minneri Kaudil uh, remain so. There's also pressure sometimes, uh, there's been discussions about converting the Mineria tank into a stock tank, which would eliminate the grasslands around Mineria, which would spell disaster for these twins, as well as the other elephants there. So if something like untoward like that does not happen, I would say they have a good future. Thank you, Dr. Fernando. Uh, so uh, just for our knowledge, um, when, uh, now we are talking about the twins, when a baby elephant is born, uh, what is the uh, tracking system that's now in Sri, if, if there's an established tracking system in Sri Lanka to monitor the growth of that baby elephant? And do we have something like that in place in Sri Lanka for the ba baby elephants? Well, we don't really, you cannot track baby elephants because uh, the only way to track elephants is by coloring them. So you can't color babies, you can only color adult uh, animals. So, but of course, uh, so it's not easy because actually if you compare what is known about elephants, most scientific knowledge about elephants is based on African savanna elephants. There's comparatively little knowledge about Asian elephants because they are difficult to study. They live in habitats where their visibility is poor and they also avoid people because of conflict. So it's not easy to follow um, young elephants and see them grow up. But in particularly in this case in Min area, I think that there is a great opportunity because there's very high visibility in Min area and there are a lot of people working there that we might be able to follow them throughout their lives and see how they do. 
Thank you, Dr. Fernando. And I know that uh, during your presentation, you did mention that human elephant conflict is a totally separate topic because there are several segments that we can take a deep dive into. Uh, so, uh, but if I touch a little bit on that, uh, especially focusing on Sri Lanka, because we, we all love our country and we want to make sure that we create a safe environment for this majestic uh, animal. As a uh, expert, a subject matter expert who have studied them for many, many years, uh, what are the few things that we can still think of that we can do that has not been done maybe uh, that would improve the environment for them to have a safe uh, lifespan? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, human elephant conflict is a complex subject, but just to put it in a nutshell, the Clearly, the problem is with the elephants that are outside the protected areas. The ones in the protected areas, there are no people, so there's no conflict. But the ones that are outside, that are sharing the land with people, elephants are attracted to crops. So obviously, people don't like elephants to come and eat their crops that they cultivate with the greatest hardship. So that's where the conflict arises. So the only way that we can mitigate the conflict effectively is if the people are empowered, if they are given, uh, found a way to protect their crops without harming the elephants. So this is something that we have been working on for many years. And just now, uh, His Excellency, the President has appointed a committee to develop a national action plan. So we are very hopeful that something good will come out of that that will help the people and also help the elephants by mitigating the conflict effectively. Well, that's that's very good news to hear, Doctor. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. So we are hopeful that uh, there will be some improvements in near future with the involvement of Sri Lankan government and with the involvement of everyone who loves elephants. So thank you so much for that. Now, uh, to wrap up, our conversation i would like to ask you because you are a, you are an expert in sri lankan elephants what is your vision for sri lanka uh, our beloved motherland to become a unique travel destination because um, i know that all around the world we have animal lovers and especially there could be um, tourists who would like to visit sri lanka just to learn more about this majestic animal. Uh, what is your vision? What can we do as uh, Sri Lankans living all around the world to promote Sri Lanka as a travel destination to research more about elephants? Well, clearly Sri Lanka is the best place in the whole world to see Asian elephants. So the most important thing is that we have to keep the elephants that we have, which is very unique in the whole world. So I think uh, the way to do it is to find a way that elephants and people can coexist and live together peacefully. And I think um, if it can be done anywhere, that is in Sri Lanka. So in Sri Lanka, we can find a way to live peacefully with elephants as we have been for thousands of years. And we can show the world how to coexist with a potentially dangerous wild animal and live in harmony. Thank you, Doctor. So thank you so much for taking the time and joining with us today uh, in this panel discussion. We truly appreciate your participation. We learn a lot today about the elephant and especially about their habitat in Sri Lanka. So. Suri, why don't we uh, take this as an opportunity to introduce uh, our next uh, panel discussion and take a sneak peek into what we have in the pipeline for the next panel discussion as well.
Yes. So for our viewers who are joining us from all around the world, our next panel discussion is Walking with Big Cats, Elusive Leopards of the Horton Plains National Park in Sri Lanka that we are going to stream live on Saturday, August 22nd, uh, Los Angeles time, 7.30 a.m. and Sri Lankan time, 8 p.m. Uh, with Dr. Inoka Kudavidanage. Um, she is a senior lecturer in ecology and conservation biology at the Department of Natural Resources of Sabaragamo University of Sri Lanka, and she's also the founder of Topical um, Ecosystem Research Network. So that is our next panel discussion. So I hope everyone can join us on Saturday, August 22nd. So thank you very much again, Dr. Prithviraj Fernando for joining us today. And for all our viewers who joined us, I, we hope you will be there with us on August 22nd for our next panel discussion. So until then, have a wonderful time and stay safe and be well, and we'll see you on August 22nd. Thank you.